believe that uh, Gorbachev is going to Japan today? Yeah. 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 Okay, my name is Katia Afegiri. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have the opportunity to talk about the part of my country in history. I'm going to talk about Japanese modernization experience and semi colonial setting uh, from uh, 1854 until 1911. Although Japan was not fully colonized by the West during the 19th century, or on the contrary, Japan is rather be remembered as one of the imperialistic nations which colonized the foreign countries. But if you look at the middle of the 19th century, Japan was still a feudal nation, dominated by the shogun and uh, uh, military class called samurai, which was quite vulnerable to the encroachment of the West, just like other Asian nations at that time. 1853, the American Pacific Fleet suddenly showed up off the coast of Tokyo Bay. It was used to be called the Yedo, that was the shogun's capital. Uh, they fired the cannon and uh, threatened the shogun government, saying that if Japan refused to open its door to the United States and open up its trade relationship with the United States, Japan is going to suffer the grave, uh, suffer from the grave uh, consequence. Well, after 150 years later, and looking at the uh, trade relationship between the two countries, I find this thing quite uh, Interesting. <laughs> well, well. So back then, the Tokyo government, well, back then the Yedo government, uh, they didn't have a, a sufficient um, military technology to cope with this military threat from the United States. So in the following year, 1854, Japan was forced to open its door to the United States, putting an end to nearly uh, 200 years that. Uh, year-long uh, national seclusion policy. Um, as soon as Japan opened its door, the other European imperialistic nations, which already started colonizing the Oriental countries, rushed to Japan and demanded that we should get the same privileges that America has just won from the Japanese. So the consequence here, the Shogun government was forced to ratify a successor of unfair treaties with the West. So among the uh, concessions the Japanese were forced to make, I'm going to introduce uh, two of them. One is the extraterritoriality, which was the right of the Western legend living in Japan uh, to be tried by their own council under their own national law. What it means is that uh, they could do practically whatever they liked, and Japanese officials couldn't do anything about it. And, uh, it which lasted until 1894. And uh, the other one is the Japanese were denied, denied to have a right to impose a tariff on the goods from the West, which lasted until 1911. These clauses were regarded by the Japanese back then, the symbol of the national humiliation. And then back then that they learned that uh, no matter how you're proud about your country and uh, your heritage and, you know, whatever, if you don't have a modern military technology, the foreigner is going to take over your country and impose their own will. So if you, um, after this period, if you look at the uh, 1860s, Japanese society was put into a turmoil. They were suffering from the hyperinflation and social unrest. So just like any other Asian country at that time, uh, Japan was well on the way to the semi-colonial status. But however, 50 years later, the beginning of the 20th century, Japan emerged on the world stage, this time as a fully modernized imperialistic nation, which is uh, politically stable domestically and economically strong enough to be secure from the further encroachment of the West into the Japanese market. And the world, the military is strong enough to defend the country and compete with the West over the overseas territories. The question is uh, how this rapid transformation was made possible uh, within 50 years. In this presentation, I'm going to try to answer this question. And in the process of doing that, I'm going to, I have to refer to the three things. Um, um, suppose this is Japan. The 
First, I'm going to talk about Japanese political culture, cultural fusion. And second, I'm going to talk about the characteristics of the Japanese feudal society under the Tokugawa shogunate. Uh, mainly focusing on the political framework and its society. And, uh, yeah, right. Then the last of all, I'm going to talk about the role of the administrators during this rapid transitional period. Like where they originate from this society and how they transformed this uh, feudal society to the modern society. Uh, by the way, for those who are not familiar with Japan, uh, let me give you a, a general description of this country. The area is about 373,800 square kilometer, which is about the size of the Montana state, or slightly smaller than the California state. The population is about 123 to 4, around something like that, uh, which is about the, uh, half of the population of the United States. The country consists of the four main islands, uh, Honshu, and Hokkaido, and Kyushu, and Shikoku, and uh, some of the small islands around them. And economically, Japan lags second only to the United States. And in terms of the uh, human development indicator announced by the United Nations in 1990, Japan ranks the first in the world now. And uh, politically, Japan adapts the constitutional monarchy system. The present emperor is called Akihito. I think he is the 147th emperor. Unlike his father Hirohito, who was once regarded as the living god prior to the Second World War, now his status is regarded by the Japanese as a symbol of the unification of the Japanese people as it's defined in the present constitution, which was promulgated in 1947 under American occupation. Demographically, 99.4% uh, of the population are Japanese, 0.5% Korean, and some Ainu minorities. Ainu people are regarded as the native Japanese. Uh, they were uh, racially classified into the Caucasian, but they, faced, uh, they were on the verge of extinction. Uh, those people can be found only in the northern tip of the northern island. Uh, probably due to this demographical composition, uh, Japan has been able to maintain a rather rigid, homogeneous society. Well, I think it can be said that uh, Japan started at the extreme end for its homogeneity, as opposed to the United States which probably stand at the other side of the extreme, you know, uh, extremity for its uh, diversity. Now, uh, let me start talking about the uh, political culture. Uh, imperial authority in Japan can be traced back to the middle of the 4th century. Since then, the real political power shifted from the inferior family to aristocrat, from aristocrat to the military class called samurai class. And even a person <coughs> called Hideyoshi Toyotomi in the late 16th century, he actually originated from the peasant family. No ruler had ever challenged the authority of the imperial family. Though on the contrary, all of them tried to utilize the authority of the imperial family to justify their legitimacy. So by the time the Tokugawa shogunate in the early 17th century they came to the power, this uh, dual rule, dual rule system, had become a integral part of the Japanese political culture. In other words, the Japanese have developed the native theory of revolution, which should be applied to any regime which was considered to be the out of date. The second point of the political culture in Japan is uh, mm, strong sense of national identity resulting from uh, geographical isolation from the rest of the world. 
prior to the prior to Japan opening the door to the United States in the middle of the 19th century, if you look at the about uh, 1,500 years history of Japan, Japan has been vastly influenced by the Chinese civilization. And to the much lesser, ex lesser extent, by the European civilization during the brief period of the 15th century. Uh, however, Japanese have never lost their initiative in choosing what they would learn and how they would use those knowledge to change their life in Japan. So prior to this crisis, there was only one time that Japan experienced national crisis. That was far back to the 13th century which was a Mongol invasion. Um, okay. oh, 13th century, the Mongol had already um, built up a huge empire that stretched from Korea to the east. They even fought against the Polish and the Germans in the Europe, and from the Siberia to the northern part of India. So in the middle... Uh, and middle down to the middle east. To the middle east, yeah, sure. <laughs> So in the 13th century, the Far Eastern theater, Japan was the only nation which still remained independent. So Kubilai Khan, who was the uh, grandson of the Chinggis Khan, uh, he sent an expeditionary force consisting of a Korean and Chinese and a Mongolian to the closest island to the Korean peninsula called Kyushu in uh, 1274 and 1281. An initial stage, they succeeded in landing this part of the island and uh, completely overwhelmed the samurai forces because they had already had the uh, uh, firepower, which was not known in Japan. But what happened is that both the expedition was brought to an abrupt end by unexpected typhoon, which happened to hit this region in both years. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> well, it was regarded by the Japanese back then absolutely miracle. So out of this uh, okay, what's the instant Japanese have developed the myth that Japan is protected God by the god, uh, which will blow the divine wind in Japanese called kamikaze to destroy the foreign invaders. Well, in their time, when they talk about the god, uh, they have the re religion called Shinto religion, which worships the sun, like Japanese flag symbolizes the sun, uh, which this. Uh, the creator of the universe in this uh, uh, religion is supposed to be the ancestor of the imperial family. So this occasion has heightened the authority of the imperial family in the 13th century. And a good example I can give you that shows that the, how little the Japanese have exposed to the national crisis throughout the history is that uh, much later here, 1944, uh, toward the end of the Second World War, uh, when the national crisis was severely perceived by the Japanese, they started looking back to history when they experienced national crisis. Uh, they have to go back to the 13th century. So at that time, uh, they couldn't uh, expect the gods to throw the wind to sweep away the American fleet. <laughs> so um, those uh, fighter pilots uh, volunteered to be a divine wind to defend the country this time. <coughs> then, the second one. I just want to start talking about the characteristics of the feudal society under the Tokugawa shogunate. This is a period when the Japanese cultural fusion gets into the final stage of completion. In uh, 1641, the shogun government closed its doors to the rest of the world, except for the Chinese and Dutch who are allowed to continue their trade relationship with the Japanese through the only open port called the Nagasaki. And the subsequent 200 years, until the American opened the Japanese, Japan's door, about 200 years, um, this national exclusion policy brought Japan absolute peace. There was no foreign war, no civil war, no uprising, no coup d'etat, whatever. That's in any way uh, threatened the authority of the shogun during this period. So Japanese had a chance to walk over 
and perfect their cultural heritage. Then, uh, also this prolonged peace gradually transformed this military class, which is a ruling class, into a bureaucrat. And also that brought about rapid development of agriculture, as well as upsurgence of the uh, merchant class. On top of that, some of the policies that Tokugawa government implemented during this period to uh, consolidate this authority as ironically uh, undermining the very existence of the feudal society. So I'm going to briefly uh, review the, the political structure during the Tokugawa period and what happened to the Japanese society at the time. Uh, first of all, the beginning of the 17th century, when the Tokugawa shogun succeeded the, uh, the Hideyoshi reign, he divided the old Japanese into the following caste system. Shogun on the top, and uh, military class called the samurai as a ruling ruling class, which composed about 7% of the society. And the next, and followed by the peasant class, and craftsmen, and they place the merchant on the bottom. The craftsman and the merchant compose about another 7% of the society, and uh, peasants consist about 84%. And uh, about 2% of the population was placed under out of caste. And um, also, Shogun classified all the feudal laws into the three categories, which is all related to modern day. Okay? Two, three. The first category was shogun family and the relatives. Of, you know, relatives. And the second category was uh, he praised the feudal laws which had been loyal to the shogun family traditionally. And in the third category, shogun placed the feudal law, which took the side of shogun when shogun got the power in the 1600s. There was a big battle of called Sekigahara. If you have ever seen the TV series of the Shogun, you know, that is a fiction, but uh, based on <coughs> this struggle between the Tokyo and the Osaka. And um, then, all strategically and economically important area, no, still is, but brought under the direct control of Shogun family. And, uh, those who were classified into the second category were provided with a lot of small domains, but positioned around the shogun's capital. For those who have been classified into the third category were provided with comparatively large domains, but they were provided, uh, they were located, positioned, eh? positioned in another peripheral area. On top of that, all domains were required to maintain a uh, costly establishment in the shogun capital where each lord had to leave their wife and children as a token of their loyalty to the shogun family. In other words, they are political prisoners. On top of that, uh, each domain had to waste an enormous amount of expense every year to carry out an uh, annual trip between the domain to the shogun's capital. So all feudal lords have to stay one year in Yedo and go back and stay one year in their own domain. They have to complete, compete, uh, repeat it, uh, next to 250 years. So this is the uh, political structure of the shogun time. Then, what is the impact of this system on the society? In order to come up with the enough funds 
So no domain, however large, they couldn't depend on the you know, isolated and self-sufficient economy. Somehow they have to come up with uh, extra rice or um, specialized crop or manufacturers, which they have to sell in the nationwide market. So that resulted in rapid agricultural development. Agricultural development. Each domain encouraged the farmers to increase their productivity. And through the reclamation of land, all the development of the agricultural technology. Also, this alternative ascendant system, which I said, this resulted in the development formation of the nationwide transportation as well as a commercial network throughout the country. And those specialized crops uh, produced in each domain have to be sold at the uh, big consu consuming area, which was the direct control of the children. This uh, area was virtually the free, free trade zone. So Merchants living here was enjoyed a, a full protection from the shogun family and they freely could deal with the domain from all over Japan. That created a highly urbanized society during the 18th century and 19th century. For example, early 18th century, the Yedo had already more than one million population, which was probably the largest in the world. And um, also during this period, the economy was fully monetized. So like a paper money or paper credit of any sort came into common use. In a big city like Tokyo or Osaka, uh, they had a, what do you say? Uh, like we have like a stock exchange, like they have a rice exchange back then. <coughs> uh, with daily fluctuating quotation developed. And the people get accustomed to paying the fixed money at the store, rather than hovering over the each item. And the other aspect is Shogun government emphasized the study of Confucianism, because Confucianism theory stressed absolute loyalty to the master. So, but the Confucianism theory, also that's important to the history study. So this period of history studies become very popular. And uh, well, the ruling class was already rid of it. And the upper class of the peasants were those who used to be a samurai class. But in the beginning of the Tokugawa era, they had a chance to choose. They could choose to be a samurai or stay in the field. There are some people who stay in the field. But those people became a wealthy peasant, but those people are completely rid of it. Also, uh, the merchant class and craftsman class Later, those people became uh, a city residents. Uh, many of those people became a little So, about early 19th century, it is estimated that the uh, literacy rate in Japan was already about 35%. And one good example is that, uh, like almost uh, all the big cities, they had uh, daily newspapers circulating and the common people could see what was going on in, in all over Japan at that time. So, by the time the United States forced open Japan its door to the West, there was a considerable gap between the feudal theory and the reality in the Japanese society. So Japan was suddenly behind the West, right behind the West in, um, what to say, uh, scientific technology, but it, it seems that they all have already satisfied most of the preconditions to take off uh, the feudal stage. So, the last, last of all, let me talk about uh, this period from 1854 until 1951, when Japan got out of the semi-colonial status.
reflecting the growing uh, social distinction in the society, the biased kind of critic comes out toward the end of the Tokugawa shogunate period. Among them, these two factions uh, have to be attached importance to because it was two, these two factions which had uh, tremendous impact on the administrator in the Meiji era. Now, I'm going to talk about where those administrators in the Meiji era originated from and how those factions are related with them. As I already explained, the Tokugawa shogunate emphasis emphasized the study of Confucianism theory. So, inevitably, resulted in the enhancing the authority of the imperial family. So, national learning faction, they called for the attention to the imperial rule of antiquity. Also, they advocated that the authority of the imperial family is about the authority of the shogun. Uh, authority of the shogun. As to the Dutch learning faction, those people were made up of the scholars who had been exposed themselves to the advanced scientific technology in the city of Nagasaki where they had a contact with the foreigner. Those people were advocating and say, appealing to the society that we should attach importance to the advanced Western technology and we should uh, introduce those technologies to change the, uh, some of the contradiction existing in Japanese society. But suddenly these two factions were considered by the shogun government as subversive. So they were often persecuted by the shogun authority. But they found a protector toward the end of the Tokugawa shogunate. These two domains. One is called Satsuma, the other is called Choshu. domains are one of the largest domains in Japan. Of course, they were classified into a third category in the beginning of Tokugawa shogunate. Both domains developed anti-Tokugawa sentiment throughout this history. Because of their location, it's far from Tokyo, and they have to waste the tremendous amount of finance for the, uh, this annual trip. So, Dutch learning faction and national learning faction, those scholars were welcomed by those domains. And especially, mm -hmm. yeah. lower rank of samurai, those people are increasingly frustrated, dissatisfied with what's going on in the society. Because as a military class, they were just useless. They didn't have any opportunity to prove their social function as a soldier. So most of the upper class samurai find a job as an administrator, but the most of the lower rank samurai they just didn't have any chance. And then, so they are increasingly uh, impoverished in the society. And we know this period was a Martian class. So toward the end of the Shokugawa shogunate, including the shogun family, and almost all the domains, except this domain, were have found themselves heavily dead to the theoretically lowest class of merchant class, merchant. Um, but these two domains were financially solvent. Why? Because they adapted to progressive people, and um, people who paid attention for were the lower rank samurai in those domains. So those people were incre increasingly find administrative positions in their domains. Because before that time, both domains are heavily debt too, to the Martian class. So they carried out a successive uh, economic uh, reformation, and they succeeded. So by the time that the American came, and opened, opened up the Japanese door to the West, these two domains were led by this progressive administrator. So 
So Japan opening its door to the United States in 1954. 1960 was a critical period in this uh, modern history. This is a Josh Batman. Josh, you okay. Uh, one thing is that uh, those progressive administrators were convinced that existing political framework has to be somehow re replaced by the new one, which is based on the more national unity uh, to cope with the West. But in order to achieve such kind of uh, social reformation, they had to follow the tradition, which means they had to make access to the imperial family. During this period, the imperial family was completely deprived of, of any political power, just like now, and they were just a figurehead. But they have a tremendous authority in the society, just like now. Too. So they tried to make a contact with the imperial family, which is heavily guarded by the Tokugawa authority. So they faced a big dilemma, because the imperial family was advocated the impractical policy of what we call joy. Joy means expelled barbarians. So the imperial family advocated the expulsion of foreigners. But they saw what was going on in China. China, Chinese, they refused to submit it to the Western civilization and they challenged the military. They are miserably defeated. And those Progressive administrators back then had, most of them had experience in visiting Shanghai and other places. They saw what was going on in China. So they thought that this imperial policy of the joy was absolutely impractical. But um, they couldn't say anything against the imperial family. That is one dilemma. The other dilemma was they had to survive in a political struggle with the conservatives. Uh, made up of the upper class officials. Those people felt threatened by those lower rank officials. But again, like a certain American visit in 1854, this foreign pressure helped them to get out of this dilemma. What happened is that in 1863, British fleet suddenly appeared off the coast of capital city of Satsuma, Kagoshima, and destroyed the capital city. <laughs> And um, so which, uh, this incident persuaded the royal family, not royal family, sorry, uh, ruling family of Satsuma, as well as conservatives, who are practically impotent, they couldn't say anything about what was going on, uh, to give up uh, this policy of foreign expulsion. They were convinced that it would be impossible for the military backward Japanese to expel the foreign powers. So, they finally won the political power in this domain. And then, uh, with the assistance of the British, they started building up the new type of navy, which is going to become the Japanese Imperial Navy in the years to come. As the Shoshu, this progressive administrator has to go through the harder path. Um, in this case, what happened was 1864, those Choshu subjects who are in the imperial city of Kyoto, they were trying to make a contact with the imperial family, were suddenly attacked by the Tokugawa Guard, having the first actual fight in the 250 years. And they were expelled from the Kyoto. After that, the Tokugawa authority forced the imperial family to issue the decree that authorized the military expedition to the Choshu domain. To the matter was, uh, allied forces consisting, consisting of uh, United States, France, Britain, and Netherlands suddenly attacked the Choshu port of Shimonoseki in retaliation for their firing of the Western vessels which was passing through this strait. So, driven to the edge, these conservatives, not this was not conservatives, they responded to the crisis by purging 
the progressive administrators. So many of the uh, major leader that comes after the Tokugawa shogunate period were the ones which narrowly survived this political assassination period. So what happened is that there was a person called Takasugi, a very important figure. This person was the first commander of the mixed brigade, consisting of not only the samurai, but of the peasants. It was a revolutionary idea to let the peasants join the army. And then they called for the peasants to fight against the conservative as well as Tokugawa force. And they succeeded. So this progressive administrator was convinced that in order to build up a strong military, not a, we have to eliminate the old concept of samurai philosophy and extend the chance to the rest of the population. Like 84% of the population were uh, uh, peasant class. So that is related to the initiation of uh, a universal conscript, which was carried out 1873 later by the same person in the new regime. So finally, 1867, those progressive administrators, which had already made a, a military coalition with the help of the sub radical court nobles, seized the control of the royal family. In the Tokugawa side, this shogun died, and then they received a new shogun. But this shogun came from one of the domains, the middle domain, which was, they were the relatives of the shogun family. But this domain was a hotbed of the pro-imperialist sentiment. So this new shogun was refused to fight against the imperial family. That resulting in what we call major restoration. putting an end to the nearly 250 years of Tokugawa rule. Now, those progressive administrators, finally, they come to the top of the nation. Uh, okay, okay. The progressive administrators, they come to the top of the nation, but of course, uh, nobody tried to uh, be a dictator. They are still following the traditional way. They did everything in the name of the imperial authority. So, now, given the chance, now what, what they really did during this period was, first of all, they eliminated uh, domestic boundaries. Okay, domestic boundaries. Japan would be divided by the big, a lot of domains. So they asked their own feudal master to restore their domain to the emperor. And they persuaded the other rulers to follow this suit. So it was surprisingly easy. 1868. Oh, sorry, 1869. The old domain practically restored their feudal land to the shogun, although they have been dominating on this land for centuries and centuries. This proves that the, how strong the, this political culture was. Next step was the elimination of the class distinction. Those progressive administrators are fed up with the impractical and out-of-date feudal system in order to create the new military, they thought that this uh, feudal structure was an obstacle. It has to be eliminated. So they had the emperor to issue a decree that eliminated the class distinction. So now, practically, under the emperor, there is no division in the country, and there is no distinction among the classes. 
they created the uh, type one nation unit. In the same year, they embarked on the universal education system for the girls as well as, as, well as boys. And then, um, this is because they attached the most importance to the education in order to create a strong soldier and a wealthy nation, which they called Fukoku Kyohei. This is the first slogan they launched in this regime. Fukoku means wealthy country, and Kyohei means strong military. In order to create a strong military, soldier cannot be a stupid. Soldier has to be dedicated and has to be intelligent. That's there. So they started the, uh, this uh, primary education, and later they embarked on the higher education. And by the early 20th century, Japan had already eliminated illiteracy. The next step was agricultural development. They started agricultural development as the initial stage of the economic development. In 1873, to secure a uh, predictable revenue from the tax service, ta uh, land tax, the fixed money tax system was adopted, and the payer of this tax was officially recognized as the uh, owner of the land. This means virtually the new government gave the land ownership to the peasantry. Then they already eliminated the feudal boundary that resulted in the assimilation of the uh, agricultural technology from the urban region to the rest of Japan. That resulted in a substantial increase in agricultural productivity. Then the next slogan they launched was Bunmei Kaika, what we call. Bunmei Kaika means this is civilization and enlightenment. While demolishing the feudal order in Japan, this new progressive administrator began to introduce the foreign institute and uh, foreign idea and technologies. And uh, virtually the world was considered to be the vast classroom for the Japanese during this period, but they were selected in what they should learn and how they should use those knowledge following traditional ways. And since the Japanese were aware that the most of their civilization come from abroad, we can't find uh, lots of things from originally from Japan. So it was not very difficult for the Japanese to realize that there was much that should be learned from the West this time. The next move was the industrialization. The government initiated various modern industry by setting up a pilot factory. Later, during the 80s, uh, they sold off the most of the non-strategic industry to more efficient uh, private entrepreneurs, uh, thus creating a well-coordinated uh, domestic industry. So, by the middle of the 1880s, Japan had emerged as a fully modern and industrial nation, which was politically secure, domestically, and economically, they were also uh, strong enough to compete with uh, West. Uh, for example, in the field of cotton thread, Japan was getting a profit already in the overseas market. And uh, this late 19th century, Japan found itself among the Western imperial powers, uh, competing over the foreign market. Then, this is a time for Japan to expand to the foreign territory. The first move was the war with China, but then the Qing Dynasty over the hegemony of Korean Peninsula. And Japan won, then <coughs> 1905. 
five, they won the first overseas territory called Taiwan. Then subsequent huge amount of indemnity from the China uh, enabled the Japanese to shift their industry, which was vastly oriented to the light industry, to the one which oriented to the heavy industry, the beginning of 20th century. And subsequent development persuaded the West to lift unfair clauses imposed on Tokugawa shogunate from 1854. And finally, in 1911, with the restoration of the right to impose tariffs on the Western uh, products, Japan finally succeeded in getting out of its semi-colonial status. <laughs> so, now, <laughs> let's answer the question of how such a rapid modernization was made possible. Well, first of all, uh, no administrator, either Tokugawa loyalist or progressive group, tried to support the foreign power against their own countrymen. The secondly, by utilizing the authority of the imperial family as a native justification for the revolution, progressive administrators in the new regime uh, consolidated the society by carrying out a thorough reformation to eliminate all the feudal elements in the Japanese society. Meanwhile, they concentrated on primary education before giving an emphasis on higher education and established a new law and order developed the communication system, encouraged agricultural growth, and the development of simple industries before embarking on the more complex and costly stages of industrialization. A significant point that, that should be pointed out is that those administrators <laughs> who seem to be uh, revolutionary in their handling of rapid reformation never violated Japan's fundamental political culture, which was a collective leadership in the name of imperial authority. Nobody tried to be a dictator, although they have a lot of chance. The success of this transformation, I conclude, should be attributed to the success of administrators in making the best use of the cultural fusion. <laughs> no problem. Five minutes more? Very short question. Go ahead, sure. uh, I, I was confused. When you say the joy policy, are you talking about Kaikoku joy or Sono joy? Sono joy. Oh, I have to say. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. There, there was a two slogan uh, to the end of the uh, Tokugawa uh, period. One is joy, and the other was Sono. Sono means honor the emperor. The joy is expelled barbarian. Kaikoku means opening up the country. Mm -hmm. So since the country was forced to open, so mm -hmm. they didn't have to argue about uh, opening up the country yes. already. There were two slogans after opening up the country. One is Joey, one is Sono. And they realized that it is impractical. Mm -hmm. More questions? Comments? Or French model and the British model. It was a different kind of uh, <coughs> developmental model, a different kind of colonial model. It's, it's kind of self imposed colonialism, which can be expressed externally. I'm sure. I mean, it was about the 20th century. Oh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, no, it's all right. I'm just uh, 
saying that I'm uh, intrigued by this. Uh, by this presentation. Point I want to ask uh, why uh, Japan is so I mean, conservative in the sense they don't want to allow other people to come in. Why is that? They don't want to allow foreigners coming into Japan. I mean, <laughs> like, like uh, I mean, it's, it's very restricted, like a tourist, okay, but for work and other reasons. Very <coughs> Why is that? Why is that closed policy there? Well, this is not too much related to this um, homogeneous culture. Uh, we have now the great problem about the foreign immigrants from especially in the Southeast Asia. They come to Japan with a tourist pass and they get a job. <laughs> we try to stay. And um, <coughs> that's the... Uh, I'm sorry, that, I, I mean, after all these things that for foreigners or for other people to be part of the worst for easy, so foreigners to be part of the country, it has been so isolated. It raises a tricky uh, yeah, Like, question. you can become a Japanese citizen only to marry a Japanese. What can this Yeah, I was saying that you've got... No, a native Japanese, you know. But, you know, you've got internal, internal uh, colonialism, and then you've got externalized colonialism. And Japan is a beautiful example of both. Uh, where you've had an internal colonial condition, and where it, it extended into a uh, external one. Uh, the West, in particular, uh, resisted that, uh, this uh, external colonial ex uh, extension of the Japanese experience. Mm -hmm. The interesting point that uh, uh, people from outside Japan want to live in Japan, work in Japan, whereas Japan was prepared earlier to come to them. You know, and to assist them, you know, <laughs> in, uh, in achieving this uh, this design, uh, it's it's in some way uh, paradox, if you will. When you when you think uh, what is involved is only that the Japanese have been successful in what they set out to do, the Greater East Asia Cold Prosperity Sphere, uh, had not uh, attacked the Americans, had not attacked the Pearl Harbor. And indeed, it continued their conquest of China and their movement into Southeast Asia, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, could we have contemplated uh, Japan as it is today in that larger colonial condition? Or is it the fact that Japan was indeed restricted to the home islands and had to use its colonial system for internal purposes? that generated all of this dynamism, initially with the Meiji Restoration, and then after uh, Japan's external experience with the Meiji Restoration, defeat at the hands of uh, the Allies in World War II, Japan goes back to another restoration, which again is <coughs> internalized colonialism of a kind, which again uh, denies others an opportunity to avail themselves of it, and so you need a new opening. You have the 1854 opening, the Americans are again trying to somehow prod the Japanese to open up, and others are trying to prod the Japanese to open up, and uh, they can't do it that way. They can't do it in a way that is going to provide the advantages for those who come from other places. Uh, so in effect, you've got to take Japan as it is. If you want them, they'll come to you. And they'll bring you their wares, They'll bring you their technology, and you have got to make some kind of adjustment with that. But to the extent that you're dealing with, as you said, a very small country and a very large population, you said at the beginning, half the population of the United States no, in, no, no. That, in, oh, yeah. in an area, <coughs> roughly, yeah. roughly, yeah. in an area, a little less, but roughly, mm -hmm. in an area, I'm exaggerating just a little bit, uh, less than the size of California. Yeah. So again, when you think of those kinds, how much room is there for others? And if you deal with that, also, you recognize that uh, the arable areas of Japan are about 10 15 percent. Most of it is mountainous, volcanic, mm -hmm. and, and so on. And so uh, you're dealing with even greater densities of population. To the extent that, that Japan could be as successful, it has to, to relate somewhat to these different points which you have uh, isolated for us. And what is key? It seems to me is a question of education. From the earliest moment, uh, this whole matter of, of the importance of education, whereas others still neglect it. Third world has neglected education.
Again, over this weekend, I was involved in this, this kind of thing with the minister, with the Secretary of Education from Pakistan, as well as the he was here. And uh, Pakistan doesn't devote anything to education. I'm exaggerating a bit there, too. But really, nothing. It's hardly 1% of GNP. Not even of revenue, in this instance. And so when you, when, you, when you deal with this, how can you possibly compete? And so, in effect, uh, you have, you have uh, inefficient schools without the necessary uh, technologies that are required, the necessary uh, equipment, etc. You, uh, you have teachers who can't teach and students who can't learn, and uh, the conditions are, are, are critical in those circumstances. How do you manage the next generation if, if this is the, the background? And of course, when people are graduated, when they are turned out into society, the jobs aren't there for them, they're not absorbed. And so again, the, the politicization that goes on, the, 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 the aspect of, uh, of revolution uh, is of a different character than what you described. There is this capacity to uh, 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 tie into external organizations, to see foreign support, the point that he made uh, <coughs> in uh, this latter stage, that with all of these different uh, groups and the, the factions and, and so on, they didn't tie in with an <coughs> external force. They still remained uh, loyal to who they were. Anyway, there's so much more there. So you want to comment? Mm -hmm. I, I, I just want to say that maybe that's because of the Confucian emphasis on, on education. Yeah. Well, that's the one thing that he really didn't get into, did he? Uh, you mentioned it as if we all know about Confucianism. Well, I just want to know about Confucianism. I know, it would be a lecture in itself. Yeah. Um, but certainly, uh, when you talk about, you, you mentioned earlier the, 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 the very brief moment of impact for the West on Japan is against this long period of history where the impact is from China. And essentially, you talk about Confucianism. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, like he is imperial family to stay away from the politics until the uh, major restoration. Mm -hmm. So that their existence is just like air. And uh, we have the same sentiment too. Like, what, like uh, when in the junior high school and elementary school, we have a lot of food literature. But wherever we go, the history outside, 1,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, every building was engraved with the name of the emperor. We can't escape from it. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> You have to, you have to just accept this as like, well. This is a um, country of the emperor. And after the Second World War, suddenly you know, a lot of the Japanese, have, some people have a hard feeling for the imperial system, but still the people cannot deny this nearly 2,000 history of the, you know, the fact that our, our ancestors followed this rule. So but there's still no dictator. Hmm? No dictator. Yeah, exactly. no, no. So as long as the imperial family just stay away from the politics, just like the Tokugawa shogunate period, it's no problem at all. Yeah, with but, but along with this question, the imperial family, the emperor, whatever he may be described as, and so on, in the past, the, the, the fact is that there is no real emphasis on personality when it comes to this question of governance. That personality is something that is extremely minimized uh, in the Japanese experience. Whereas in so many other areas of the world, personalities are worth it. So you may talk about the fact that you are tied into a tradition that identifies with the emperor. But at the same time, uh, there are those uh, in the world who uh, identify with, uh, with maximum rulers, with dominance of power, without there having that kind of uh, rooted uh, historical significance. Uh, I was just going to point out, unlike Chinese Confucianism, Go ahead. No, that ja in, in, in Japanese politics, there's no maximum ruler. Unlike in, you know, in like Confucian, yeah. you know, Chinese Confucian. Right. Right. But what about China, where there is a maximum ruler? How about in Singapore, where you've studied, where there's a maximum ruler even now? Okay. Uh, all maximum rulers have to go one day. I mean, uh, Kim Il-sung is also a maximum ruler, but he's 79 today or something. I was surprised when I heard his birthday was today. He was 79 years old. I think. Who is it today? I mean, he was just a, just a baby when he took power. Oh. And now here he's 79 years old. Oh, that's 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 that. But, uh, mm -hmm. but not Japan. Mm -hmm. Japan is not mm -hmm. Well, thank you very, very much. I wish we had it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
we turn on Wednesday? There's a lot to do. What? For those who come and leave, we yep. just, uh, we had a you know, benefit. So, uh, it's about the exam is concerned. For the exam, that which I spoke about earlier today.